A Warhammer Novel, Giant Slayer, Godric and Felix, Volume 7, written by William King. This is a dark age, a bloody age, an age of demons and of sorcery. It is an age of battle and death, and of the world's ending. Amidst all the fire, flame and fury, it is a time too of mighty heroes, of bold deeds, and of great courage. At the heart of the old world sprawls the Empire, the largest and most powerful of the human realms. Known for its engineers, sorcerers, traders and soldiers, it is a land of great mountains, mighty rivers, dark forests and vast cities. And from his throne in Aldor reigns the Emperor Karl Franz, sacred descendant of the founder of these lands, Sigmar, and wielder of his magical warhammer. But these are far from civilized times. Across the length and breadth of the old world, from the knightly palaces of Bretonia to icebound Kislev in the far north, come the rumblings of war. In the towering World's Edge mountains, the orc tribes are gathering for another assault. Bandits and renegades harry the wild southern lands of the border princes. There are rumors of rat things, the skaven, emerging from the sewers and swamps across the land. And from the northern wildernesses, there is the ever-present threat of chaos, of demons and beastmen corrupted by the foul powers of the dark gods. As the time of battle draws ever near, the Empire needs heroes like never before. Sylvania had proven to be a haunt of horror. The events at Drakenhof Castle left us filled with sadness and fear. We had prevented the rising of a great terror, but paid an awful price. And there was no respite from battle and dread. No sooner had we overcome our undead foe, than we found ourselves thrown headlong into another even more desperate adventure. One that was to involve the titanic legacy of a long dead race, and an encounter with the greatest living sorcerer of this age of the world, as well as battles with foes more horrible and deadly than almost anything we had faced before. During the course of these adventures, I was to learn far more about the secret history of our world than I ever wanted to learn, and found my life and soul in the greatest of peril. Even now, looking back on these terrible events, I am amazed I survived. Many of my companions were not so lucky. From My Travels with Godrek, Volume 4, by Herr Felix Jäger, Aldorf Press, 2505. Prologue The earth shook. All around him, people were screaming. Huge buildings shuddered. The statues of the gods toppled from their alcoves in the shrines of ancient temples, shattering into a thousand pieces as the earth writhed like a dying serpent. He ran through the streets of the ancient city, seeing the looks of horror on the faces of his people. He passed decaying mansions where the desiccated ghosts of previous owners gibbered thinly in their fear. Ahead of him, the mighty column of the seafarer teetered and then collapsed. The phoenix king fled from his high perch, his outstretched hand seeming to wave in terror as he tumbled earthward. As he crested the high hills overlooking the mighty harbor, a glance at the peaks rimming the city told him the worst. The mountains blazed with light as wild magic ran out of control. He could sense its unbridled power even at this distance, and knew, without having to cast any divinations, that something was deeply, deeply amiss with the old spells that protected the land and the people. Somehow, he wasn't sure how, he was atop the mighty wall that had guarded the harbor for a dozen ages. Looking out to sea, he saw the thing that he had feared most of all. A towering wave, twice as high as the wall, driven by a force that would shatter the city, raced ever closer. Within it, mighty leviathans raised from the deep that surrounded the island continent roared and bellowed and sought to break free. Strength that could shatter the largest of ships in seconds was useless in the grip of that terrible tsunami. Knowing that it was futile, that there was no way he could endure this, 
he prepared himself to resist, drawing on all his power, readying his mightiest warding magics. But somehow, as he had known it must be, nothing came. Power trickled into him, where once it would have flowed. A hundred times the height of the tallest man, the wave towered above his head, cresting, ready to break. For an instant, he gaped into the eyes of a trapped sea monster, feeling a certain kinship with it. And then its huge pink maw gaped, teeth the size of swords glinted in the shadows, and the mighty wave tumbled forward to break against a wall with awesome irresistible power. It swept over him, crushing him, drowning him, and smashing him down into the depths, and it rushed forward to sweep the last and the greatest city of the elves from the face of the planet. Suddenly, he was elsewhere, in a place that was not a place, in a time that was outside time. There were presences there, not dead, not living, mighty mages all. Their faces were etched with eons of pain, scarred from fighting a battle that no mortal should have been asked to fight. Even he, who was accounted mighty among the wizards of the world, was daunted by the power of the spells around him. More than that, he was frightened by where he knew himself to be, and when. The shadowy presences danced around him, constantly performing a ritual they must never stop, lest they bring disaster upon the world. They were wraith-like, and their movements were slow and pained, like the clockwork figures of the dwarves whose mechanisms were slowly winding down. Once, he knew, they had been elves, the greatest wizards of their age, and they had sacrificed themselves to save the land and the people. Greetings, blood of an Aryan, said an ancient voice, dry, dusty, but with the faint lilting accent of the mountains of Calador still. Greetings, lord of dragons, he replied, knowing who he faced, wondering if this was a dream, knowing it was not. We are remembered still among the living, then, said the voice. Remembered and honored. That is good. That is some repayment for our sacrifice. There was more than a hint of self-pity in the voice. Understandable, he supposed. He would probably feel sorry for himself as well if he had been trapped at the center of the great vortex for five millennia, struggling to hold together the web of spells that kept the island continent afloat. The scene shimmered like a reflection on the surface of disturbed water. The ghastly, ghostly figures seemed to recede, and he was glad. He ought to let them go, but he knew he had been brought here for a purpose. Why am I here? he shouted, and the words seemed to echo through infinite caverns and resound into distant ages. The old barriers are falling, the paths of the old ones are opened, we cannot hold the weave against it. What am I to do? Seek the source of disorder, find the oracle of the truth-sayers, she will tell you what you need to know. Close the ancient pathways, go swiftly and go alone. You will find the allies you need along the way, and in the most unexpected forms. Go, there is little time left, even this sending is weakening us, and we must conserve the little strength we have left. Even as the words echoed up from the bottom of infinity, the voice was fading. A great fear came over him. The Archmage Teclas sat bolt upright, pulling the silken sheets from the naked forms of his companions. Cold sweat covered him. He could smell it even through the musky scents worn by the two courtesans. What is it, my lord? asked Shianara. Concern showed in her beautiful narrow face. What ails you? Nothing, he lied, rising from the bed and limping across the room. He reached for a goblet and a crystal decanter of wine cut in the shape of a dragon. Is it the dreams again, the nightmares? He shot her a cold glance. What do you know of nightmares? he asked. You talk in your sleep, my lord, and lash out, and I guessed. He looked at her long and hard. These were words his enemies would pay a lot to hear. 
There were no nightmares, he said, reaching out for the power. Unlike in the dream, it flowed strongly into him. There were no dreams. You should forget these things. A slight blankness came over her beautiful face as the spell took her. She looked at him and smiled quizzically. Go to sleep, he told her. And when you awake, remember nothing. Instantly, she slumped next to the form of her twin. He shrugged, wishing that he could sleep so soundly, knowing that he never would again without the aid of magic, and that was something he could no longer afford. Momentary guilt afflicted him that he should treat a fellow elf so, but these were strange and evil times, and the need for security was paramount. Ancient enemies were stirring, old gods were awakening. Every oracle and soothsayer between here and Cafe predicted doom. His own star chart spoke as much. He took a sip of the bitter wine. It flowed down easily. He gestured, and the robe fluttered around the room, wrapping itself around his naked form. He pulled on a pair of slippers made from the finest cafe and silk. He reached out, and his staff leapt into his hand. He limped from the chamber and down the cold, echoing hallways of his ancestral home. He made his way to the workroom, knowing that he would do as he always did, and seek comfort in knowledge. The few servants still awake scurried away, knowing from his frown that it would not be the best idea to interrupt his reverie. Dark times were coming, he knew. The dreams were impossible to ignore now and he had long ago learned the unwisdom of doing that anyway. In the deepest cellars beneath the mansion, his workroom provided him with a haven. As he entered, he spoke the words of command. Immediately, wards sprang into place. The air shimmered with their brittled power. Not even the mightiest demon could penetrate these. A trapped homunculus stirred slowly in the jar of preservative fluid. It gestured at him obscenely as he limped past. The creature was not happy with its home. Tiny gills pulsed in its neck. Its thin, leathery wings stirred the liquid, turning it cloudy. He gave it a cold smile, and it froze in mid-gesticulation. Very few things in this world or beyond had the courage to cross him when an evil mood was upon him. He moved through the chamber past the ordered alcoves containing magical paraphernalia, and the elaborate index series of volumes in a hundred languages, living and dead. Eventually, he found what he sought, the strange apparatus he had unearthed in the ruins of the ancient Cathayan city nearly two centuries ago. A massive sphere of verdigreed bronze, engraved with strange runes reminiscent of the work of the decadent denizens of Lustria. Teclis sat cross-legged before the sphere of destiny and contemplated a dream. It was the third time in less than one month when it had come to him, each time more clear and vivid than the last. This time, though, was the first time when the ancients had talked to him. Had he really talked with the ghost of the ancient wizards that protected the land? Had they reached out through the barriers that bound them and communicated with him? He smiled sourly. He knew that dreams could be sent to warn or to harm, but he knew equally that sometimes dreams were only his own deeper mind talking to him, giving shape to fears and intuition. Either some friendly power or his own deepest instinct was trying to warn him about something. It was irrelevant which. He needed to act. You didn't have to be a grand wizard to know that something was amiss in the world. Reports from eagle captains brought tales of disaster from the furthest lands. In Cafe, the warlords had risen in rebellion against the mandate of heaven. In Araby, a fanatic calling himself the prophet of law was stirring up the natives to cleanse the world of evil. And his definition of evil included anyone who was not human. In the cities of the Under Empire, the Skaven were stirring. The forces of the Witch King once again strode the soil of Ulfuan. Elven armies mustered to head northwards and opposed them, and the Elven fleets patrolled the northern seas constantly. 
Just a month ago he was in Lodern, at the court of the Phoenix King discussing the matters, and having done so, was told to prepare for war. He passed his hands over the sphere. The casings of the metal bands contracted in on themselves, revealing a milky white gem pulsing with its own internal light. He spoke the words of the invocation he had found in a scroll from the reign of Belcorhandres, nearly three thousand years ago, and the lights danced across the surface. He snapped his fingers, and the candles of hallucinogenic incense, concentrated from the leaves of the black lotus, sprang into life and began to burn. He breathed deeply of them, and opened his senses to the fullest, feeling his point of view being sucked into the depths of the crystal. For a long moment, nothing happened. All he saw was blackness, heard only the muted drumbeat of his own heart. He continued the invocation, working effortlessly on a spell that would have taken a lesser mage a lifetime to master. Now his vision seemed to hover over Ulfuan. He could see it perfectly even in the darkness, and he could see those things that would be visible only to a mage. He saw the flows of magic pinioned by the waystones that kept the island continent above the waves. Raised by elder world magic millennia ago, it needed the same magic now to prevent it from sinking beneath the surface of the sea. In the dreams he had spoken to those that maintained the spells. He knew that was significant. He saw the tiny glints that were his fellow wizards working magic the intricate structures of spells that were woven by masters of the most magical of all the world's people. Sensing a disruption in the flows of power, he sent his consciousness racing in the direction from which it came. Far to the north, he sensed the abomination that waited at the farthest pole. It pulsed with energy, no longer quiescent, promising the end of the world. And still, it had not fully woken. But yet... Within heartbeats, his spirit eyes soared over the chaos wastes, as close to the influence of the polar abomination as he dared go, taking in the vast hordes of black-armored warriors camped on the cold plains, and the hideous legions of horned beastmen following them. He saw the huge flows of chaotic energy that the winds of magic blew over them, but he saw nothing there to cause any disturbance to his island home. All the same, it was disturbing, the size of that huge invasion force. It was bigger than anything the diminished power of the elves could muster, and he knew that was only a fraction of what the dark powers were amassing. Then he sent the sphere arching through the sky towards the ancient city of Prague, and saw that it was still in ruin, although its people were making valiant efforts to rebuild it. Interestingly, the dwarves were present, it seemed the ancient enemies of his people had come to help the humans in their hour of need. He let his eyes dwell on the massive citadel, wrapped as it was by spells that not even he could penetrate, and wondered what it was kept in the depths beneath the fortified pinnacle. What ancient oaths bound the humans to rebuild their haunted city in the face of the unbreaking cycle of destruction? The speculation was interesting, but it was getting him nowhere. It merely confirmed what he had heard, that the greatest invasion in centuries was taking place in the old world, and he feared it would take more than the might of man and dwarf to repel it. He raised his point of view higher until the curve of the sleeping world lay beneath him. The lines of power flowing through the night like an enormous web were visible to him even through the white turbulent spirals of the clouds. He inspected them carefully, looking for clues, and found them. From the northern island of Albion, the lines of power that would normally have flowed to Ulfuan did so only weakly. Sometimes they flickered and faded. Sometimes they blazed brightly and massive pulses of power raced out over the sea in the direction of the island continent. Out of the chaos wastes, pulses of power raced towards Albion and then diminished. From Albion, the flows raced onwards towards the Empire, Bretonia, and Ulfuan. What was going on there? What magic was this? Those webs of energy dated back to the most ancient of days. What could be using them for its own ends? 
Nothing good. That was certain. He sent the point of view of the sphere rushing towards Albion. It hurtled towards the magical barriers that surrounded the island, into the mist, and there it was stopped utterly and completely. Not good, he thought. Albion had always been surrounded by spells of great potency intended to ward it from the eyes of outsiders. Those spells obviously still held. No, he thought, that was not quite true. Now they felt different. There was a subtle taint to them, of both evil and something else. Briefly, he considered what he had seen, and a horrible suspicion began to grow in his mind. Fragments of certain ancient forbidden texts, written by mad elven wizards in the dawn ages of the world, came back to him. Legends of the world's most ancient gods, which talked about things best left forgotten. But apparently someone had remembered them. Someone had disturbed the things that were left best untouched. Fear clutched at his heart as he considered it. He needed to consult certain ancient sources, and he needed to do it now. If what he suspected was true, there was indeed not one moment to waste. Dawn found Teclis on the balcony outside the library, a book spread on his lap, his face resting in his hands. The old mansion built on the side of the highest hills surrounding the city of Lodern gave him a fine view of the harbor. It was flat and serene as a pond. Not the slightest hint of the enormous tidal wave of nightmare menaced it. Briefly, he wished he was back at the Tower of Hoef, with the greatest library of the world close at hand, and his fellow mages to consult with. But that was a foolish wish. Politics had brought him here. He did not like the place. He did not like this place, the ownership of which he was sharing with his brother. He had not liked it when they were children, and did not like it now. Too many old memories, he supposed. Too many recollections of long evenings of illness and infirmity. It reminded him way too much of a hospice or one of the temples of euthanasia, where the old and the weary of life went to end their lives in peace and comfort. He dismissed the thoughts. Even as he did so, the earth quivered. It was very mild. The wine and the goblet merely rippled. The walls of the old palace barely quivered. It might have only been a natural earthquake, but he doubted it. All the signs were clear. Something was interfering with the ancient spells that bound the island nation of Ulfuan together, that stopped it from disappearing once again beneath the waves. And if something was not done, the nightmares would come true. Aldref, one of his older servants, entered. The old elf had orders not to disturb him for anything less than a summons from the Phoenix King himself. Your brother wants to speak with you, he said. Teclis smiled sourly. There was no way of denying he was at home. This place was as much Tyrion's as his own and the servants were as loyal to his twin as they were to him. More loyal, he thought acidly. Of course, his brother would depart if he indicated a wish for privacy. His manners were as perfect as everything else about him. Teclis turned his gaze back to the sea. You are in a vile mood today, he told himself. Show my brother in, he said, and prepare food if he wants it. It is a little early to be drinking that vintage, said Tyrion, as he strode out onto the balcony. There was a hint of reproof in the voice that was equivalent to a thunderous chorus of disapproval from anyone else. Teclis looked up at his brother. So tall, so straight, the limbs so clean and so unbent, the face so honest and open, the voice as beautiful as a temple bell being run to greet the dawn. Astonishing, he thought, that this golden creature should be my twin. It seemed that the gods had lavished all the gifts upon him and left me an ill-made creature. I take it that means you won't be joining me, brother. He knew he was being unfair. The gods had gifted him a gift of magic unequaled in this age of the world, and the will necessary to use that power as it should be used. Still, there were times when he would have easily swapped all of that for Tyrion's effortless popularity, 
his ease and courtesy, his ability to be happy even in the unhappiest of times, and his astonishing good health. On the contrary, it is my brotherly duty to keep you from drinking alone. The gods alone know what that might lead to. And there it was, the famous charm, the ability to change the mood of the situation with a smile and a seemingly thoughtless joke. Tyrion reached out for the decanter and poured himself a full goblet. There was no formality there. None of the endless empty ritual that Teclis so despised in elven social gatherings. It was the casual gesture of the warrior more at home in camp than in the Phoenix King's court. And yet, it was exactly the thing his brother knew would put him most at ease. Teclis could understand why there were so many at court who compared his brother to Malekif in ancient days, before the Witch King had revealed his true colors. He had known his brother all his life. But even he wasn't certain just how much art went into that carefully contrived artlessness. Tyrion waved and Teclis looked up. On the balcony above them, Shianara and her sister waved back. They looked at Tyrion with a mix of open desire and adoration he had always commanded from women. Useless, of course, as his brother had eyes only for his consort, the Ever Queen. He had not, unlike most elven males, ever been unfaithful. What is this early morning toast in honor of? Tyrion asked. The end of the world, said Teclis. Is it that bad? said Tyrion. The end of our world, at least. I do not think the Dark One will overcome us this time, said Tyrion. It was exactly what Teclis would have expected him to say, but there was a watchfulness about him now, a wariness. Suddenly, though, he looked exactly like what he was, the deadliest elven warrior in twenty generations. It is not our dear kinsman and his lackeys I am worried about. It is Ulfuan itself. Someone, or something, is tampering with the watchstones or the power that underlies them. These earthquakes and eruptions are not coincidence, then. I had suspected as much. No, they are not. You will be leaving soon, then. It was not a question. Teclis smiled as he nodded. His brother had always understood him better than any other living creature. Do you want some company on your journey? I am supposed to be leading the fleet northwards to face the spawn of Nagaroth. But if what you say is true, I am sure the Phoenix King can spare my services. Teclis shook his head. The fleet needs you. Our armies need you. Where I am going, spells will be more useful than blades. Teclis slammed down his drink on the fine ivory table. It almost spilled over the parchments that were there. He had spent most of the night writing them. Please see that these are copied and delivered to His Majesty and the Masters at the Tower of Hoef, he told Aldreth. Now I must go. I have a long way to travel and a short time to do it in.